spherical because the outer, if we're in spherical, the outer surface changes depending on your spherical element there. As you rotate your spherical element, is that obvious to everyone? If you're emanating from the origin, say in this direction, your outer surface here is the blue one, but as you rotate down, you're inside, and then your outer surface is going to become the gold sphere. So we don't have a uniform outer and inner curve, so we can't just do outer curve minus inner curve or something like that. Can't do it. Everyone see that? So you'd have to break it into regions. You'd have to figure out, like, you'd have to create a cone and then figure out the volume of that and then figure out the volume outside of the cone that's inside of the, uh, the gold ball. So that would be hard. So what they're suggesting, suggesting is to find the volume of the, of the, let's see, what do they say here? Find the volume of the sphere and the volume of the portion of the sphere that's not inside the hemisphere. So if we find the whole, if we find the volume of the whole gold sphere, and then figure out the volume that's not in the hemisphere, then we can subtract that from the volume of the, of the sphere, and then we have what we're looking for. And if we do that, we do have, if we're looking at just the region that's outside of the hemisphere, so if we're looking at that region right there, that does have a consistent inner curve and a consistent outer curve. If you were to draw a spherical element there, in other words, a line emanating from the origin. So emanating from the origin, here the blue hemisphere is always the inner surface, and the gold one's always the outer surface. So that would, that would work there. Everyone agree with that? See that? So the volume of the sphere first, let's just get that off the table. We need to know what the radius of that sphere is and how, how are we going to convert this over to rectangular. Let me do a quick refresher. Let's look at the cylindrical conversion for a moment. Because this is important to be able to, cons to construct. Because you're not going to be able to just memorize cold the, these formulas that we're about to put up there. Right, those are the polar conversions. You know those. It's actually cylindrical. If we add z equals z, we've added the z component to cylindrical. Or the z component to polar, which makes it cylindrical. And then to get over to spherical, we need to get rid of the r's and the z's. Theta is common. Theta is both in cylindrical and it's in spherical. So theta is common. But we need to get rid of the r and the z. r and the z are not spherical coordinates. So what we did is use that triangle, which I called the spherical triangle. And again, this one is super important to, to remember. I'm going to rotate it so I can visualize that angle as coming off the origin. So that spherical triangle, we have our yeah, I can't rotate that easily. Let me just put the coordinates in there. So phi is coming from the positive z-axis down. I'll just put that there. And then phi is like this from the positive z-axis down, which makes phi that element right there, or that angle right there. And then this distance down here is r. This distance is z. So that's the spherical triangle that tells us how to convert from polar to spherical. And what we do is just look at the trig function sine and cosine of phi. And if we look at that, we see that r is equal to, and this radius here is, of course, rho. So we're going to get rho times sine of phi or cosine of phi for r. Sine phi, because it's opposite, right? That's sine, rho sine phi, or phi, whatever. And then for z, we get rho cosine phi. So those are our two conversions. That allows us to take this polar and just substitute in and jump over to spherical. Rho cosine phi there. 
And then here we get rho sine phi sine theta, and then rho sine phi cosine theta. So those just those you have to be close by. You've got to be able to get to the spherical coordinate system uh, from the cylindrical coordinate system. And that, that triangle is just essential. It's the only way to do it in a nice constructive way. <clears throat> okay. All right. So anyway, though, we still, here we have, and we also have, if we put things in the standard form for a sphere, we have this relationship, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to rho squared. So we also have that. All right, so how are we going to convert this to rectangular? What should we do to both sides? Multiply by what? If we want to change that back to rectangular, because we need to change it to rectangular so we can know what it is. Like we're not used to looking at spherical equations and saying, oh, that's a sphere of radius 2 centered at 0, 0, 2, right? But we are familiar with the x, y, z form of a sphere. So we want to convert that to spherical. And what do you multiply both sides by? How about if I said this? If I said to graph r equals sine of theta as a polar curve, how would you convert that? How do you know what that is in polar? What would you do to both sides to convert that to rectangular? Multiply by r. Did you say that? No. Who said that? Right? Yeah, multiply by r, right? And if you multiply both sides by r, then you have x squared plus y squared equals x or y. Y. And then you can put that in standard form by subtracting the y, completing the square, divide by 2 square, you get a quarter. Add that to both sides. Do your whatever that's called when you do this. <sighs> Completing the square. Right? Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> right? Much <laughs> yes, yes. Complete the square. So same process here. What do you think we're going to multiply both sides by? No. <laughs> R is not a spherical coordinate. We need to multiply by a spherical coordinate. It's like R. Uh, rho. 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 If you multiply both sides by rho, then you can convert back to uh, the rectangular coordinate system very easily. And we're multiplying by rho because we know that rho cosine phi is z. And we know that rho squared is that. So this is how we know what that sphere is. And by that I mean what's the radius, what's the center? That's how this is how we know. So that's what the rectangular equation of the sphere is, the gold ball. Um, so we subtract off the 16z to the left. We complete the square, divide by 2 in square, so you get 64 on both sides. So then this tells us that the sphere has a radius of 8 and its center is 0, 0, 8. Which is, from the picture, you kind of maybe surmise that, but that doesn't, this is how we know for sure that the center is 0, 0, 8 with a radius of 8. So that's what the... <clears throat> That's what the sphere is. Now we want to find the volume of that sphere. The volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So the volume of the sphere is 4 thirds pi times 8 cubed. So whatever that is, what's 8 cubed times 4 divided by 3? Some of you do that. I can't see up here. Say again? 2048. 2048 over 3 times pi. So that's the volume of the gold ball, the sphere. All right, so that's our starting point. We've got the volume of the sphere. Now we have to figure out the volume outside of the hemisphere. 
So inside the sphere, but outside of the hemisphere, and then we can subtract it from that. OK, so now let's, in order to do that, we know theta is going to go all the way around. And we know that rho is going to go from rho equals 8. right? Rho equals 8 is the hemisphere's radius. So it's going to start out there at rho equals 8. No, did I say that right? It's both. Uh, yeah, rho equals 8. So rho equals 8. So it's 8 units from the origin that it's starting. And it's going out to what's rho for the outer one? Rho is equal to? 16 cosine phi. So we're going to go from 8 to 16 cosine phi. Those will be our limits for rho. Theta is obvious all the way around. Phi goes from 0 is the positive z-axis. Then we have to figure out what phi is for the intersection of the two, of the sphere and the hemisphere. Right? Yes. We have to figure out what phi is. Is that hard? Yes. <laughs> False! It's easy! Because we have rho equals 16 cosine phi, and we have rho equals 8. So what do we always do when we want to figure out where two things intersect? We put them into each other, right? We merge them. That's not a math word. We simultaneously solve the system, right? So we have that. So that is the intersection curve between the two spherical surfaces. Well, we've written them both in spherical. We have rho cosine phi. That's the spherical representation of the upper sphere there. And rho equals 8 is the spherical representation of that hemisphere. So we just set those equal to each other. We're almost there. So then cosine phi is positive 1 half. So then what's phi? Everybody agree? Unit circle, pi over 3 is up there. And that's got the cosine value of 1 half. The x value is 1 half. So rho is equal to uh, rho. <laughs> so phi is pi thirds. Everything good with that? So now we can set up the integral that's going to represent finding the volume inside the sphere and outside the hemisphere. So that triple, that triple integral is going to be, so we're going to do surfaces on the inside. We're going from rho equals 8 to rho equals 16 cosine phi. And now our integrand for volume, rho squared sine phi, that's just part of the differential. And then we have d rho d phi d theta. Rho there to there, phi 0 to pi over 3, and then theta 0 to 2 pi. So that is going to catch the stuff, all of that volume in there. So pi over 3 from the z-axis down. And then outside of rho equals 8 and inside rho equals 5, uh, 16 plus 5. Does that make sense? OK, so no thetas, nor will there be a theta. So we're going to just collapse that integral. The inner one. The phi guy stays. And then integrating with respect to rho, we get rho squared over 3. Rho cubed over 3. So visual, this stuff. <laughs> right? <laughs> you really have to be able to visualize it. Or you, it's so different than Calc 2. Calc 2 is so, you don't really need to know what's going on in Calc 2. You just have a bunch of formulas you can just grind away. <clears throat> this stuff, you can't picture it, you can't do it. 
Okay, so we're going to substitute that in. So we're going to have 16 cubed times cosine. Oh, good grief. Hopefully something happens that's good. Good. Will it all will it be a nice substitution? Not that nice. It's at least all cosines. All right, I think that looks good. Everyone agree with that? Oops. This page is getting narrow. All right, so now we're going to integrate. That actually is a nice substitution one. Um, we can factor out 8 cubed all the way to the front. That might help us a little bit. So we have 2 pi over 3. We're going to factor out 8 cubed. What's 8 cubed? Is that 16 five. times 8? What is it? 96 or something? 8 cubed is what? 5 12. Oh, 5 12. What am I saying? 96. Right, 5 12. 64 times 8. Yeah, 5 12. Okay, and when we pull 8 cubed out of here, are we left with 2 cubed? All right, so that's 8. And here's where we've got to be a little clever. So we're going to let u equal cosine, so du is minus sine. So I'm going to put a minus out here in front and a minus uh, right in front of, I'll just put the minus right in front of that 8. Okay. And um, well, so what we have then is u cubed du. So the integral of u cubed is u to the 4 over 4. So we're going to have cosine to the 4 over 4. And that will be the first part. And then over here, um, I've got to be careful because I factored a minus out of this, which means I pulled it all the way to the front, so it's distributing here. So I also have a plus there. And we're integrating sine, and we're going to get minus cosine when we integrate sine. So I'll get another minus back. Is everybody OK with that? Okay, any questions on that in there? And should that, everyone go click K on the 8, that minus and that minus, everything? Any questions on any of that? Because that's the hard part right there, where now it's just a little bit of a walk to the end. Okay, so then we have negative 2. And we're going to evaluate at pi over 3. Cosine of pi over 3 is a half. So we have a half to the fourth, so 1 over 16. <clears throat> minus. A minus is plus. Now we have 2 times cosine of 0 is 1. So that's just 2. <laughs> All right, and then we come over here, minus. That's that. And then we have to subtract, but the subtraction gets distributed, so double check the signs. I think that's right. So this minus 2 is out in front, right there. Plug in the pi over 3, we get a 16th. Subtract to subtract turns into a plus, what we get when we plug in 0. I have a question. Yeah? How did you absorb the sign? What's the, so if we do a u sub, u is equal to cosine phi, du is equal to minus sine phi d phi. So that, so u is this, so we have u cubed, and then that's the, that's part of du. I cheat the plus two. Yeah. This one right here? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to just rewrite this as negative 2 out in front, just to clean it up. So we have this whole thing evaluated at pi over 3, which gives this. And then minus this whole thing, 
which makes it plus 2 times cosine of 0 to the 4th. Cosine of 0 is 1 to the 4th. Okay, so it's, it's this. So what I did was did the plus and minus of that term and then the plus and minus of that term. So okay. you know what I say? Yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Right, so this is leading to that, and this is leading to that. Okay. Yeah, instead of going all the way across, I, yeah, I could have done that too. All right, so then minus 1024 pi over 3. Inside here, we have minus 1 eighth. What's all that? Three. So two and a half, so five halves plus five halves, which is twenty eighths. That's going to be negative. There's a sign somewhere that's not right. There's a sign somewhere that is not right. Two and a half, that's five halves. So <laughs> minus one eighth. Yeah. 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 Do you see a sign that's wrong? Uh, Randy? Are you sure it's not the plus two there? Because the cosine of zero is equal to one times the two to the sheet, but it's in positive. Right. It would, that's going to be positive here when we subtract off and get 19 a, but that's still negative. Something. Is it the, the sine when you integrate it to the negative cosine? So, so co u is cosine. Over there. Well, see, I factored out this minus uh, here. Yeah. So if I distribute that minus back, I get plus this stuff yeah. and plus yeah. this. That, oh, you think about that, that could be. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. So u is cosine, du is, du is minus sine phi, yeah, that, that's good. So that minus right there goes to that. That's part of the difference. That's one of those ones. Can you follow that? So u let. U equals cosine of phi, then du is minus sine phi d phi. So that's why I put that extra minus in. I, I should have put in one more step. So that minus that went in here gets sucked into the differential there. So then when we actually do the integration, the minus is gone. Yeah. Is the minus on the outside stays? Yep, minus on the outside stays. Because we put a minus on the outside and a minus on the in. I did two steps at once, which I shouldn't have done. So minus on the outside, minus on the inside right here. And then when we actually do the integral, that minus goes away. So that minus goes away there. And then this becomes minus 2. And that is fine over there. OK, so then we end up with, so it's positive 1 eighth. And then here, we end up with negative do we end up with negative 3 halves? Negative 1 and a half? So minus 12 eighths. Everybody okay with that? So this adds to positive 1 half, and then we subtract off 2, so we get negative 3 halves. Negative 3 halves multiply top and bottom by 4, we get that. So this is then positive, and we have 8 in the denominator, so. That's going to be 24. And we have 12 subtracted from 1, so that's 11. So 1024 pi times 11. 1024 and 24 and 11. Yeah, and so what does that all reduce to? 1024 times 11 divided by 24. 1024 times 11 divided by 24 equals. It's 1408 pi over 3. Okay, so that's the volume outside the hemisphere. 
subtract that from the volume of the sphere, and that's the answer. So our final answer, our sphere was 2048 over 3 minus 1408 over 3, whatever that is. What does that turn into? 600 and something? Or 560 or something? What is it? 640. 640? Thank you. All right, so there is our stuff. That's what's inside. Wow, that's a cool problem. That's a cool problem. That is a cool problem. Wait till next chapter. The <laughs> next chapter is really cool. <laughs> if you're a physics guy or woman, uh, the next chapter is really lots of physics applications. All right, let's go ahead and do the last section. The last section is really a summary of, of really the previous sections in chapter 13 where we're converting coordinate systems. And the whole idea in 13.7 is that we are going to change variables and we need to know how to do that in multi dimensions. You've done it in one dimension for years, Cal well, a year, at least a year. Calc 1 and Calc 2. Calc 1 feels like you've known it forever now, though, once you're in Calc 3. Uh, so in Calc 1, you do this substitution here. And this is just right from the first page of the book. I think it's a really, it's just a good conceptual thing that gives you a good idea of what we're about to try to do for multi-dimensions. So when you do your substitution, you can think over here, this is an XY system. And over here, we have a UY system. And the volume, the, excuse me, the area on the left in the XY system matches the area on the right in the UY system. Okay? And that differential that allows us to go between the two, right there, we're saying that the differential over in the U system, we've got to take twice the differential in the X system. So that's sort of giving us this correction factor that we need when we do the conversion. So that little guy right there is going to be, we're going to generalize that. So the next step in this process, when we went to polar, we ended up having to put the r in there, into the integrand, the r d r d theta. That r is just like that too. It's the correction factor that compares and forces the corresponding areas to match. Okay, so we need that differential relationship for these areas to match. Uh, so that two, so the two, the, t the relationship between du and dx is what allows this equality to, to um, allows that equality to happen. So now let's go to two variables. With two variables, we're not going to call it a function anymore. We're going to we're going to refer to something called a transformation. And we're going to think of taking points in the UV plane and transforming them into points in the XY plane. And here's the visual for it. So we're going to call this transformation capital T. And when you get into linear algebra, you that's what linear algebra is all about, transformations from one space to another space. And this is the typical visual. You've got points in one set or space, and they're going to be mapped into points in another space. So T is the transformation, and then the X and Y, these are the little formulas that tell you what to do to the UV points to get to the XY points. So we're going to take a point in S, a UV point, we plug it into these functions, and that's going to correspond to an XY point. And for the uh, change of variables theorem to work, what we're trying to do is build a one-to-one -one function from S to uh, R in this case, so S to R trying to match one point here to one point there. And when I say one to one, I mean on the inside of S. So the points interior to S need to map in a one to one way to the points interior to R. 
Boundaries are a little different. Boundaries don't always have to be one-to-one. -one, but what's inside S has to match what's inside R. Okay? So then this should look this should look like an example of the polar conversion. Right? We let x equal r cosine theta. So we had a function of r and theta over here. And y was r sine theta, so we had a function of r and theta on, on that one also. So that's a really good example to always go back to. So transformations from t to s, they, they need to be one to one on the inside. So that's what I've put in blue here. So for the transformation to be one to one, it just means the same thing as it means for functions. If you go back and you look, this transformation is going to be one to one if I, if there's a if and only if. So if I'm going this direction, I only go to one point only, and if I'm at that point, I go back to one point only, and it's that point. Right, so there's no, you know, there's no double images for a single pre-image. Points in this set are often called the pre-image, and points in this set are often called the image. So R is the image of S through the transformation T. And sometimes they'll just write it, R is T of S. They'll say that R is the image of S under T. <clears throat> OK, so now this paragraph is important here. So the idea is that we need to somehow create this correction factor. If our dA in our xy plane is dx dy, we need to figure out what the dA looks like in the other plane. And that's what the Jacobian is. The Jacobian is going to give us that correction factor. The Jacobian is going to give us the adjustment that we need when going from the UV plane to the XY plane, or vice versa. All right. OK, so what we are, our goal then is to simplify either the integrand or the limits of integration. That's our goal. So when we converted to polar, it actually was focus more on the limits of integration. Because usually r was coming from a constant interval and theta was coming from a constant interval. So that was simplifying the limits of integration. But just as important, sometimes we're going to have an integrand that we can't integrate without converting. And so in that case like that, we're thinking of doing a change of variables so that the integrand becomes friendly. So like the first example I had up there from one variable calculus, this guy right here, the limits are simple. Those are fine. They're both constants. But here, it's the integrand that's messy. So we do a change of variable over to here, and now that's easier to integrate. All right. So that, the idea is that we want to do a change of variable if we need simpler limits or we need simpler, a simpler integrand. So it can work either way. Sometimes it's both. So let's take a look at this notation. This notation is totally weird. This notation, we have the partial derivative symbol all by itself, that's script D, in both the numerator and denominator. So this is a definition of what that notation means. This notation right here, which you don't need to write it down, you don't need to know it, I'm not going to ask you for it. I would just call this determinant J and not bother with this as much. But that's what this notation means. And it's really the only time you ever see that notation is when you're dealing with Jacobians. And let's take a look at the innards of this determinant. Everyone clear that this is a determinant and not just a matrix? Because right, the, the bars are bars, they're not brackets. If it was a bracket, it would be a matrix. But if it's bars, it's the determinant of that matrix. So look across the top row. The idea, and again, think of the polar transformation. That is your anchor into this whole new thing. So with polar, we wrote x is r cosine theta, and we wrote y is r sine theta. And so if we look across the top, the top row is x sub the two new variables. So if we were dealing with polar, it would be x sub r and x sub theta. Okay, so the new variables are the ones that we're partialing with respect to. And then 
x top row, y bottom row. And determinant, main diagonal minus the other diagonal. Okay, so that is the Jacobian determinant. Jacobian determinant. It's not always positive, sometimes it's negative. And then we have our change of variables theorem. Our change of variables theorem says, okay, we've got x's and y's. We're going to find some transformation. Again, think r cosine theta, r sine theta. That's the best one to think of. And when we do our conversion, we've got to change our integrand from x's and y's into u's and v's, or r's and thetas. And then we use the absolute value of the Jacobian determinant. So the Jacobian determinant could give you a negative 2. Then you just take the absolute value, and that is your correction factor. That's your adjuster. That's going to adjust so that a little area here will match over here. So that's the correction factor. So in the integral over r, dA corresponds to dx dy. In the integral over s, dA co corresponds to du dv, dv. And then this relation right there, so that's the correction factor. That's like the r in r d r d theta. And it's analogous to when you were back in one variable calculus, you rewrote your differential as du equals g prime of x dx. So right there, that is an analogous. That's like the Jacobian right there. It's the correction factor. So let's do a simple problem first. And here they are, we want to just investigate what this concept of a transformation means. So we're trans transforming from a two dimension, a region in two dimensional space to another region in some other two dimensional space. So a little different than what you've done in the past. When you think about functions, you went from the real line to the real line. Let's just draw a quick image here. So here, when you look at y equals f of x, you're taking x's and you're finding y's. So that's a transformation from r1 to r1. When you're doing functions of two variables, when you're doing surfaces, your domain points are down in the xy plane. And then you have a z value up here on the z axis. So you're taking points in the xy plane, and you're transforming those points into a real number. So this is a transformation from r2 into r1. This is a transformation from r1 into r1. So a regular function, you put in a number, you get out a number, real to real. Our surfaces, you put in an ordered pair, and you get out a number. So you're transforming an ordered pair, so in other words, an element of R2, into a number, which is an element of R1. This is totally different. Now we're taking an ordered pair, and we're going to convert it to another ordered pair. So we're going to go from R2 into R2. So from one set in R2 to another set in R2. So that's kind of the analog to the functional uh, work that we've been doing. Okay, so here are the transformations. And we've got to get to this point where we have x and y written in terms of u and v. Because that's how we find our Jacobian. The Jacobian was x sub u, x sub v in the top row, y sub u, y sub v in the bottom row. So we have to have our transformation equations solved for x and solved for y. All right, so let's try to do this one then. So in the UV plane, let's draw a picture of, of the region in the UV plane. So in the UV plane, we have the unit square. So we're considering all ordered pairs in that region right there. So that's the, the set S. So that, nice simple limits, right? u 0 to 1, y is, uh, v 0 to 1. So super simple. And now we have to find the corresponding region in the xy plane. So in the xy plane, let's see. These guys are going from 0 to 1, 0 to 1. We're going to 
what, what typically is best is if you map the, the, the vertices. If there's any vertices, map those over. All right, so when u and v are both, let's make a little table. So we're going to take the ordered pair 0, 0, and this is in the region S. And then we're going to get a corresponding point in the region R. So the transformation T is going to be applied to 0, 0. So we come up here, we're plugging in 0 for u, 0 for v, and sine of 0 times 0. It doesn't really matter what sine of 0 is because we're multiplying by 0. So x is 0. Plug in 0, 0 here. Cosine of 0 is 1. That doesn't really matter because we multiply by 0. All right, so the origin is being mapped to the origin through T. So T is this transformation that's taking us from the S region over to the R region. All right, so the origin gets mapped to the origin. Then let's go to 1 comma 0. So 1 comma 0. So here U is 1 and V is 0. Well, V is 0. So that coordinate is then going to be a 0 also. Over here, u, um, we're mapping u is 1 and v is 0 again. So that's also going to the origin. And so these are on the boundary. And here's where I said the 1 to 1 doesn't really matter if you're dealing with the boundary points. And we're on the boundary. So right away, you're saying, hey, that's not 1 to 1. I've got two distinct points that are being mapped to the same point. It's OK if that's on the boundary. All right. So then let's go to 1, 1 and see where that's mapped. So 1, 1. Sine of pi is 0. So we get 0 for x. But then y, finally, we get one that's not 0. Plug in 1, 1. Cosine of pi is negative 1. Right? So cosine pi is negative 1, so we have 1 <coughs> times negative 1, so we have negative 1. Maybe I should move my vertical axis. So that's going to 0 minus 1. All right, let's check the other two vertices. Or the other one vertice, I guess we only have one left. So 0 comma 1, where does that go? So 0, 1. Plugging in 0 for u and 1 for v. So 0 for u, sine of 0 is 0. So that's going to be 0. And then over here, uh, cosine of 0 is 1. So we're going to get 0, 1. So we're up here. All right, so those are, the, how, those are where the boundary points go to. Now, let's see if we can fill in the pieces. So right here, we, we know that u is going to go between 0 and 1. We know v is going to go between 0 and 1. Can we then somehow use that information to figure out the range here? So here, solve and compute the Jacobians, solve the following relations for x, and, for x and y. So they've given us our transformations here. But what we need to do, we have to have x equals something and y equals something in order for us to find the Jacobian. So let's solve this system for x and then solve it for y. So the easiest way may be to eliminate x first. So if we multiply the top, this first equation by 3, I didn't multiply 4 by 3 very well. So multiply by 3. And then over here, we can just put that in as is. And then if we subtract the 2, then the x's go away. So we'll have 3u minus v equals 10y. So this tells us that the y coordinate will be equal to 3 tenths u minus one-tenth v. So we've got, u, uh, we've got y. Now we have to find x. So instead, let's now go back. And to get x, let's rewrite this system. We'll use the exact first equation. 
And let's just double the second. So we have 2v equals 6x plus 4y. Again, let's take the difference. So we'll have u minus 2v equals minus 5x. So that tells us that x is going to be equal to, let's put x, well, I guess we can put it below. It doesn't have to be. So x is going to be negative 1 fifth u plus 2 fifths v. So this is the conversion. That pair of equation will take, will take a uv point and transform it into an xy point. And now we can find the Jacobian. So the Jacobian is always the determinant of x sub u, x sub v, y sub u, y sub v. So that's our Jacobian matrix. We have to take our transformation equations, write them as x equals and y equals, so x and y dependent on u and v, and then take the partials of the x equation, the partials of the y equation. And then the determinant will give us 1 times 1, so 1 50th minus 6 50ths. So that's minus 5 50ths. And that'll be minus 1 10th. So the Jacobian determinant is minus 1 10th. And if we were plugging it into an integral, we would take the absolute value and put in 1 10th. But that's all they wanted here was the was that. Okay. All right, so let's do one. Let's do a real one then. There's no integral. We need an integral to do it, to do a real one. Okay. All right, so here they say sketch the original region of integration R in the xy plane, sketch the new region S in the uv plane, given the change of variables, and then find the limits, compute the Jacobian, and do the change of variable. All right. Now that's an integrand that you might say, okay, that's not too hard to integrate. Um, let's take a look at our regions. Let's see if maybe the region is going to be a lot simpler. So let's first draw our xy region. So x is between 0 and 2. That's simple enough. x is just this interval 0 to 2. All right. And then y's are going between y equals x and y equals x plus 4. So y equals x there. y equals x plus 4 is uh, the same curve but shifted up four units. So let me draw it like that, I guess. And it is a line technically, but whoops, but we don't really care about the line. We just care about what's happening over here because they tell us x is from 0 to 2. So the region over here is this parallelogram. So yeah, that region's not so easy to integrate over. It's not so hard. There's our region R in the xy plane. So let's now go look at the region in the uv plane. So we have, uh, let's rewrite these guys. So we're going to have u equals x over 2. Do I really need to do that? Let's see. Yeah, it's probably easiest. Okay, so u is equal to x over 2. So if x is going from 0 to 2, let's figure out what u is going from then. So then u is going to be between, when x is 0, u is 0. When x is 2, u is 1. And then v is going to, let's see, we have, we're going to have to do a little substitution here. So 2u is equal to x, so we have y equals 4v plus x. Uh, so v, 4v will be equal to y minus x, and v will be equal to 1 fourth y minus x. <clears throat> All right, so then where is v going to be between? So if, if we're plugging in, 
x and y both 0, then v is, I don't, I don't want a 1 there yet. Okay, so if we plug in x and y both 0, what is the least v can be if we look over here? What is the least v can be? Everyone agree that 0 is the least it can be? So the, the least it could be is if y is, y is 0, that's part of this region, y equals 0, and then when y is 0, x is equal to when x is 0, then y is 0 here. But the largest, if x is 0, the largest y could be is 1. Oh, yeah, but the least, let me think about it. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, can x be, when y is 0, can x be more than 1? And the answer is no. When x is 0, y has to also be 0. So the least this is going to be, then, is 0. And then how about if we look at the maximum possibility? What is, how do we make y minus x maximized? So y is equal to, what's this intersection point up here? That's 2 comma what? 2 comma 6. So the largest y ever is is 6. And when y is 6, x is 2. So the end of the v range is going to be at 1. So then in the uv plane, we're going to have this unit square. U, U is going to go 0 to 1, and V is going to go 0 to 1. So in this plane, we're just going to have a square where U and V each go 0 to 1. And that's going to be our region here. And they call that S. All right, so there's S. going to take us about 10 more minutes. So why don't we take a break now and then we'll come back and we'll finish this one and then do the next one. Let's pause there. Pause. Let's take a break. Uh, so with this guy, we get this unit square in the, in the UV plane. And I just wanted to, as I was staring at it, I was thinking, is there an easier way to decide on what the UV limits were? And there, it's actually, this one's cooked up pretty nicely. And what I want to do is suggest a slightly different way. There I was trying to extrapolate from what the range of x and y were to what the UV limits would be. And I see a simpler way here. So I want to erase this and just make the following observation that should simplify finding those. Because I felt like it was a little ambiguous when we're looking at the different points here. And we can absolutely map the points. Mapping the points is always good. If we look over here, we can figure out if x and y are both 0, we can plug them in over here. And if x is 0, that means u has to be 0. If y is 0 and we know u is 0, then v has to be 0. So you can map those corners for sure. But this one is cooked up in a way that's actually simpler, which I didn't notice at first. If we have this relationship that x is equal to 2u, let's actually just plug it in right there. So let's take and substitute what we have for x right there. And then if you divide all three sides by 2, then you get your u 0 to 1. A little cleaner if you use the whole inequality instead of trying to run through the possible values. And this one also is nicely set up for y. Watch what happens here. If we do the same thing, it's not always this way, but this one, if we just plug these values in right into the inequality, it's cooked up nicely enough that the u's just disappear. That's the part that I was kind of struggling with when I was thinking, OK, well, what, what does the range on the v look like? And actually, this one's set up nicely so that if you substitute right into the inequality, it all falls apart really nicely. 
So we get that V goes from 0 to 1, we get that U, U goes from 0 to 1 on that. Now I also want to go back, I was just looking at this other one, there was something nagging at me about, set, about 12. And this is what's nagging at me, I messed this up. We mapped our points, that, that was easy, we mapped those points. We, we just plugged in 0, 0, plugged in, one, that, that, that mapped really easily. The part that I screwed up was this. So when we're looking at this, the, I want to I wanna take and look at these segments. So right here, on that segment, V is equal to 0. And u is going from 0 to 1. If v is 0, boom, those all are going right to the origin. That whole segment, all the points in that segment are going to the origin. And again, let's, let's do that same kind of thing for this. So let's take and look at this segment right there. Instead of just looking at the corners, because with the trig functions, it changes things. And, I, and that's, it was bothering me, and I went and looked at it more carefully. And it, I definitely screwed it up. So if we look at the, that segment, the u value is 1. And so when the u value is 1 right there, and v ranges, so let's just take a look at these individually. When u is equal to 1, and v is allowed to range. So if we do it this way, sine of pi is definitely 0, so that's 0. And cosine of pi is negative 1, so that's going to be equal to um, what I say v is going to range. So this is going to be negative v. All right, so let's look over here. So that means that x is always 0 no matter what, right? Along this segment, x is always 0, and the y value is always going to be minus v. So that is going to take us right down. And I used red. Let me use a color that I'm not using elsewhere. So if this is purple, that's going to take us right here. Do you agree? So if v is going from 0 to 1, that means y is going from 0 to negative 1. So that's going to be that segment right there. And here's the part that I totally blew up. When we go from uh, here to here, so what is the, for there to there, the, what is the possibility here? Okay, v is always 1. So up here we have x equals sine of pi u and y equals cosine of pi u. All right, because v is 1. On that segment right there, v is always 1. And so then let's let u range from 0 to 1 here. So what's happening? When u is 0, we are definitely down here when u is 0, correct? When u is 0, sine of 0 is 0, cosine of 0 is negative 1. So it's 0 comma negative 1 down here, right? But that's the parameterization of a semicircle there. As u goes from 0 to 1, when we get u value of 1, yes, we are up here, like I said, we're up here, but we don't get there along a rectangle. When u is equal to 1, sine of pi is 0, cosine of pi is 1. But if we're parameterizing something sine comma cosine, it's a circle. It's not a, it's not, I don't know what the heck I was thinking. We don't go like that. We get to it by doing a semicircular path. So we have to move along the circle like this, the semicircle on this side. So we're going there to there. And then the last piece does what we thought it was doing. That's coming back down. That's going to match right there. Yeah, so, the, so that would be the region in the xy plane, this semicircular, this, that semicircle piece right there. Not the rectangle. Boy, model. Any questions on on that? So, if we're following, I, what I did originally was picked in the corners and then just assumed that it was going to be line segments between them. That's not true. 
It's true if you have linear functions, but if you have trig functions, it's going to be curved. So, Bradley? Um, how do we know that it's circular other than just recognizing this? So, that's how we know. So, because if we have this, if we have x equals sine of pi u and y equals cosine of pi u, like I said earlier in the class, we, need, we know the xy equations. We don't know these non-xy equations. So how would we convert that to an xy equation? What would you do to convert that to an xy equation? Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, right? So we know that sine squared um, theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1. So if we plug in sine of pi u quantity squared plus cosine squared pi u is equal to 1, so that gives us x squared plus y squared equals 1. So that's just a parameterization of the unit circle. It's not the standard parameterization. The standard param parameterization starts at positive x and goes this way. That one is going to start down here and go that way. Okay, so let's finish this one off. So we we know the limits of integration for the new integral are now u and v both go 0 to 1. So this one is a lot simpler because the corners here are going to map to the corners there, and the functions are linear, so we get segments. We're not getting any weird curves. So let's do our conversion. So the Jacobian is going to be found we have x and y written over there. The Jacobian matrix, the Jacobian determinant, will be x sub u, x sub v, y sub u, y sub v. So the Jacobian determinant will be 8 minus 0, so that's 8. So when we do our conversion now, our double integral will be equal to so for our substitutions, we have x squared y, but we're using this substitution. So x squared is 4u squared, and then y is 4v plus 2u. And then Randy, you asked about the order here, and the order, because it's a square, doesn't matter. The only reason we might want to change the order is somehow inside this integrand, one way was easier than the other, but this is just a polynomial, so it's not going to matter. So if we distribute the 4u, we put the 4u squared, let's actually factor that 4 all the way up to the front. We don't need to have that inside. Actually, we can factor an 8 out to the front, can't we? Let's factor an 8 out to the front. So then we're going to have u squared. with respect to u, two-thirds u cubed v plus u to the fourth over four, or one-fourth u to the fourth over four. That. Plugging those limits in for u. Plugging them in for u, we end up with two-thirds v plus one-fourth, dv. So that will give us v squared over three, plus one-fourth v, or v over four, zero to one.
Um, let's see here. So when I integrate, let's see. So when we plug in, do you agree with this right here? So when we integrate with respect to v, we should get v squared over 2, so the 2's cancel. Integrating 1 fourth is just v. Yeah. Um, oh, do we know? Oh, we didn't put in our, yeah, we got to put in our 8. Sorry about that. Yeah. So the Jacobian factor, that needs to be inserted. Thanks, Randy. So that should be, and usually they put it right here, but because it's a, um, a constant, we could factor it all the way to the front. So it should be 8 times 8 out there. Yeah. Don't forget the Jacobian. Times 8 times 8 times 8 times 8 times 8 times 8 Thank you. 112 over 3. seem right now, I promise. All right, so this guy, integrating xy, we could definitely uh, manage that integrand, but let's look at this region of integration. We have an ellipse there. That's also manageable. You have some crazy square roots, though, and it might lead, and it probably would lead, if you want to, you can test. It probably will lead to something you don't want to deal with. But let's see what happens. So first off, let's be clear on what this, this region is. Let's divide both sides by 36. And when we divide both sides by 36, we see that we have the following ellipse. So that ellipse is stretched vertically. That ellipse has intercepts of 3 and minus 3 on the y-axis and 2 and negative 2 on the x-axis. All right, so there's the region that we're trying to integrate over. Definitely complicated. A circle would be way easier because you have the square root of whatever, 4 minus x squared, 4 minus y squared. This, though, you're going to have the extra term in there with the coefficient, so it's not going to be nearly as possible. It might be, but it maybe not. OK, so here's what they tell us. They say, let's convert to the UV system using those substitutions. Yeah? So I just want to clarify real quick. Sure. The, what we're doing here is finding the volume under that curve that functions x, y over that elliptical yep. domain. So that's down in the x, y plane. And the surface, we're finding the volume under this surface. So this surface is you know, some undulating thing above the xy plane, or finding the volume beneath, between the xy plane, or finding the volume between that surface and that ellipse, yeah, that elliptic domain. So that's in the xy plane. <coughs> and let's do our conversion with those substitutions. So let's find our Jacobian. So the Jacobian is x sub u comma x sub v, y sub u, y sub v, and then we find the determinant and we get 6. So there's our correction factor, 6. So when we convert, we're going to have, we have to plug in, we have to change the x's and the, x's and the y's to u's and v's, so we have 2 u multiplied by 3v, so we get 6uv. Then we have to put in our Jacobian factor, 6. And then we can go either du dv or dv du, but we need to know. Hmm. So let's take a look. This is our region in the xy plane. Let's find our region in the, in the uv plane. 
So if we want to find the curve in the UV plane, let's substitute the Y and the X into here, then we'll eliminate Y and X and we'll have a curve in the UV plane. So in some ways, if you have a curve, it's a lot easier because you don't have vertices to deal with. We can just do a direct substitution. So we're going to have 9 times 2U squared plus 4 times 3V squared equals 36. And so that's going to be our UV curve. Don't have to deal with vertices. A lot easier. So that's going to be 4 times 9, 36 U squared plus 36 V squared equals 36. So that's going to be U squared plus V squared equals 1. So that's just the unit circle in the UV plane. So in the UV plane, our shape is just a circle of radius 1 centered at the origin. Right, so that's going to be an easier domain to deal with. Find out. Okay. So, now that we know that that's our domain, let's do this. What do you think? What should we then convert this to? Yeah, polar. So this is over, now I'm forgetting which region was R and which is S. Let's just call this, did we call them, was R the XY or was S? R, R is XY, okay, so S is the UV. So this one's S, this one's S, right there. Oh yeah, right there, so R is the XY. Good for my eyes. All right, so this, then we can do more conversions. So we have 36 double integral of U times V. Well, we're just going to convert to polar, just like we use X equals R cos theta, we're going to let U equal R cos theta. And instead of Y equals R sine theta, we're going to let V equal R sine theta. Because V is vertical and U is horizontal. So 36 is factored out to the front. And then in here we have r cos theta times r sine theta. And then the differential dA, that becomes r d r d theta. r is going 0 to 1, theta is going 0 to 2 pi. So we Jacobian over to the UV system to a circle. A circle is a really nice polar region, very polar friendly. Now we're good to go. So, integrating with respect to r first. We have r cubed, so we're going to get r to the fourth over 4, cosine theta, sine theta, and r is going 0 to 1. And that will give us one-fourth, which comes out in front and makes a nine out there. Zero to two pi. And then we need to use substitution. Should we let u equal sine theta or u equal cosine theta? Sine, definitely. So I'm just going to regroup it. We regroup it. Then we have U, and we have DU right there. So we get U squared over 2. So we have 9, and then sine squared of theta over 2. That's U squared over 2. And that's from 0 to 2 pi. Oh, wow. How was it? What do we get for our answer? Zero. <laughs> Anticlimactic. Zero. So that means it's that the original curve was surface. Which, when we look at that region, that actually makes sense. Right? There's just as much above. It's above. You know, it's kind of got hoods. It's got a hood above the XY plane there, a hood above there, and then a hood below and a hood below kind of thing. 
But as soon as we converted it over to the UV system, polar, we can't use polar with that ellipse, right? Everybody agree? With that ellipse. That Yeah, exactly. We would do the square root of 1 minus v squared, square root up top, and minus square root up below. Yeah. All right, so here's one where we're going to construct the transformation ourselves. They've given us the use of the v's in the past. This one, we're going to construct one. So they tell us that the, the xy region looks like this. So they tell us that we're going to look at y equals x, and this equation here is y equals x plus 2. This one's kind of cool. So so those are the first two equations, y minus x equals 0. Maybe I'll label them over here too. So y minus x equals 0. And this is hinting at a substitution right away. It's hinting at, hey, let's do y minus x, and then u will go from 0 to 2. And then over here, we have x plus y equals 0. So that's y equals negative x. So y equals negative x. I have to extend that. So then the other one, the second, the third equation right there, that's y equals negative x, which is different colors, so y equals negative x is going to come in like that. And then y equals negative x plus 2, so it looks kind of like that. So we get this diamond region. That's our region R. All that in there. This point right here is 1 comma 1. This line is y plus x equals 0. This line is y plus x equals 2. When we, when we look at this integrand, also notice this. We can factor this into y minus x and y plus x. The inside of that square root. Okay, so let's guess. Let's just try. We're going to let u equal, say, y minus x. And let v equal y plus x. So let's do that. So we're guessing on those substitutions. See if it all works. And if we use those substitutions, what is the interval for u and what is the interval for v? u is 0 to 2. And v is 0 to 2 also. So let's see if that makes it all pan out nice and easily. Now to do our Jacobian, we have to have x and y solved as dependent on u and v. Again, go back to polar and think, oh yeah, we have x equals our cos theta, y equals our sine theta. So we always have to get x and y equal the other variables. So we need to do some math here. Adding the equations together eliminates the x. That allows us to solve for y nice and neatly.
if we subtract the equation, if we subtract equation 2 from equation 1, the y's disappear and we can solve for x. If we subtract, we'll get u minus b equals negative 2x. Divide by 2, negative 2. We get negative 1 half u plus 1 half b. Now those are the two equations we're looking at. X and Y dependent on U and V. And that's what we need to get our Jacobian. So our Jacobian is then equal to the determinant of X sub U, X sub V, Y sub X, excuse me, Y sub U, and Y sub V. There is our Jacobian. So we take off the coefficients of u and v. Top row for x, bottom row for y. Find that determinant. That's going to be negative 1 fourth minus 1 fourth. That's negative 1 half. All right. So now when we come back to our integral, we're going to do our conversion now. So when we do our conversion from the xy system to the uv system, we're going to have square root of u multiplied by v. And then we have to put in our Jacobian, which is the absolute value of the Jacobian determinant. So absolute value of negative 1 half. And then we have du dv. The limits were really nice for both, 0 to 2 and 0 to 2. We've got that. So any questions up to that moment? So in this particular case, the way they gave us the boundary curves, we have this diamond, kind of suggested what we should use as our substitutions, our, our change of variable. Okay, so let's integrate. And both of these, in either direction is going to be the same in terms of difficulty. Pull the one half out in front. So if we integrate with respect to u, we have u to the half. v to the half is constant with respect to u u to the half, integrate, we get u to the 3 halves times 2 thirds, put the 2 thirds out in front. Multiply by v to the 1 half. Two third out in front. Those limits are for u, so we have 2 to the 3 halves, that's 2 root 2. Two to the three halves, that's two cubed, which is eight, square rooted. Two in the denominator is the root. Three is the power, so it's two cubed, square rooted. All right, let's pull the two root two out in front. Two root two over three. Integrate v to the half, so we get v to the three halves multiplied by two thirds. Zero to two. It's going to be 4 square root 2 over 9. Plug in 2, and we get 2 root 2 again, minus 0. So that's all going to be 16 ninths. Woo, 16 ninths. At least it's not zero. At least it's a quotient of perfect squares. That's pleasing. Huh. 
Any step there that you want to look at? Let's do it. Are you guys ready to try one by yourselves? <laughs> okay, try this one. Try 34. There's some very obvious suggestions in terms of the substitution. So see if you can figure them out. <coughs> survey of calculus class. I'll draw the sketch up here. There's your region R. Clearly you don't want to do that in just X, Y. That was very complicated. Bradley? The shouldn't the second red line you drew, the one at the three you should read. Uh-huh. Shouldn't that be at three sixty? Uh y equals three x. Y equals three x. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can tilt it up a little bit. should be steeper. A little steeper. More like that. So y equals x, y equals 3x. Jacobian yet? Question on the graph? No. We're just so we're graphing the two the two. No, 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 okay, I got that. The graph you got? Okay, let's do it slow. Does everyone agree on that graph? We just have some region that's trapped between two hyperbolas and two lines. Is that okay? Levi, is that true, yeah? Yep. I agree. I like that graph. <laughs> is everyone agree on that graph? Y equals 1 over X, and Y equals uh, 3. Um, y equals 1 over X, and Y equals um, 4 over X. Yep. Two hyperbolas that are kind of concentric -y. All right. So what is the... What do you think the substitution should be? What should we let u equal? 3x. Well, let's go with these first two here. xy. Yeah, xy. If we let u equal xy, then xy is trapped between 1 and 4, so that means that u is trapped between 1 and 4. And then what was the second one then? v equals y over x, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And y over x goes from 1 to 3. So that's our substitution. Say that again? It's way easier when you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Next one you'll be able to do. I mean, when they give us the curves, there's a really... So the idea here is that 
for whatever reason, we've got this nice region that's bounded between these curves you know, that have the same nature. We have two hyperbolas, we have two lines. And so if you have that kind of region in the xy plane, integrating over that region would be really crazy with respect to x and y. You'd have to figure out your intersection points, you'd have to parse it, it'd be really hard. But if we have this symmetry going with the boundary curves, this conversion is, is going to make it really easy. So we, we're converting to u's and v's. If we let u equal xy and v equal y over x, that will work perfectly. Okay, but now to do the Jacobian, we have to solve for x and y. So the natural choice for our substitutions is great, but it doesn't allow us to find the Jacobian until we solve for x and solve for y. So we've got to write x and y in terms of u and v. All right, so I'm not really following why y over x goes from 1 to 3. Right, y over x is 1, and then y over x is 3. So y, it's trapped, bro. <laughs> so y over x is trapped between 1 and 3. No? You got it, bro? <laughs> <laughs> right? So if we look at if we look at the equations, we see that y over x is going from one to three in there. <laughs> What's your Jacobian? Come on, Ari. You're not really there if you don't know what the Jacobian is. Okay, one step at a time. Good point. Yeah, I learned that lesson today. All right, so how do we solve that for x and b? x and y. Simultaneous solve type of thing. And we've got to we've got to eliminate somehow. We have to substitute, do something to get rid of other stuff. So, um, looking at the bottom equation, we could we can go into either one. It's not going to matter. What do you want to do? Solve the bottom equation for y and plug it into the top equation? Sure. All right, so if we solve for y, we're going to get x times v equals y, and then we're going to plug it into the top equation. So u will equal x times xv. So then we can solve for x. So we're have, we'll have x squared is equal to u over v. So that tells us that x, we're in this region over here where x and y are positive, right? So we can take the square root, no problem. So we get the square root of u over the square root of v for x. Now we know x, we have to solve for y. So from this equation right here, we have that y is equal to x times v. So we're going to do square root of u over square root of v multiplied by v, simplify that, and we get square root of a u times square root of v. And I'm just leaving it separate because I know we have to integrate with respect to u and I think it was at or v, it's just going to be cleaner if we leave it separate. All right, so let's find our Jacobian. And Jacobian. All right. So, the Jacobian, once we have x and y, the top row is x sub u and then x sub v. The bottom row, y sub x, uh, I mean y sub u, y sub v. So, x sub u first. Partial derivative of that with respect to u is going to go right there. Partial of that with respect to u. The root v is just a constant. So, we're going to have half v to the minus one half. Correct. <laughs> you agree with that? Partial with respect to u. The root v is in the denominator. It's a constant. Just comes along for the ride. We have square root of u, so it's one half u to the minus one half. And then we have to do. Uh, with respect to v, maybe if if it's if you want. If we write that as v to the negative one half up there, that makes it easier. Whatever you want to do. Or you can do quotient rule. So I'll do quotient rule here. So 
low partial high with respect to V is what? Low D high, if we're partial with respect to V, zero, minus high D low, so numerator, partial of the denominator with respect to V, so again, the one half V, you know, one over two root V, one over two root V, that's a little messy, one over two root V, all divided by the denominator squared. Denominator squared is V. Okay. This Jacobian is obviously not going to be a constant. No. Definitely not. To go to Y. Partial it with respect to U. So we're going to get partial of V, or excuse me, root of V is just constant in the numerator. U to the one half, so we have one half U to the minus one half. And then partial that with respect to V, and we're going to get something really similar. Get that. All right, let's see if we can multiply without making a total mess. So we're multiplying main diagonals product. Multiply across there. So in the numerator, we have root, uh, root U. In the denominator, when we multiply that, we're going to have 2v square root of u, which, of course, that will cancel in a moment, plus, now we have to multiply those. And I'm going to just simplify this guy before I multiply up here. Let's rewrite this as minus. Uh, square root of u divided by 2. And that v, those v's are going to combine to v to the 3 halves. You could write it as v root v if you want. doesn't matter. I have a question. Yeah? Isn't that 4 v root u on Yes. Sorry. 2 times 2 is 4. Thank you. 2 times 2 is 4. No. 2 times 2 is 4. Definitely. We're multiplying the denominators together. Absolutely correct. 100%. So now we have to multiply those two denominators together also. The numerators will be root u times root v. Root u, root v. Denominator is another fourth for sure. And then we have a root u. And we have v to the 3 halves. Here I'm going to write it as v root v because the root v's will cancel nicely. It'll be easier to see it. So then our simplified Jacobian determinant is 1 over 4v plus, and on this guy, the root v's cancel, the root u's cancel, and it looks like just 1 over 4v. So that's 2 over 4v, which is 1 over 2v. So there is our Jacobian. Say that again, Levi. Uh, because a, a determinant is this minus this. So we have minus the minus when we do our determinant. Minus. If you have an extra minus, just erase it. Just get rid of it. All right, let's convert our integral now. So our integral, we have with our substitutions, we have e to the xy. So xy, where's our substitution? Right there. Somewhere in here. Oh, there it is. Let me highlight it. So there's our x, and there's our y. All right, so x times y is going to be that times <coughs> that. So we're going to get u, period, right? Just u. Just you. Multiply that. Now we have to put in our Jacobian times 1 over 2v. And then we do du dv. 
And we found that our U's went from 1 to 4 and our V's went 1 to 3. Hey, Jim. Yes? I was wondering, although in this case it's obvious that V will never be negative, is it important for us to keep the absolute value sign in there? Uh, well, you don't need to keep it in there, but you do need to make sure that it's true. Okay. Confirm it somehow. If it isn't true, you have to keep it. Well, so if v, let's just suppose V went from negative 3 to negative 1. If V went from negative 3 to negative 1, that means that V is always negative in your region. So then you would put minus 1 over 2V here okay. if V was always negative. Okay. You would force it to be positive by multiplying by minus 1. Yeah. What if it goes from a full range from positive to negative? The, we're negative. not going to see that. Okay. No. It's going to be consistent. Yeah. Okay. Blink? All right. Integrate with respect to u, and we get e to the u over 2v, and the u's are going from 1 to 4. So that gives us uh, e to the 4 minus e to the 1 in the numerator. I'll bring the 1 half out in front. So we have e to the 4 minus e to the 1, which is just e, divided by v, dv. Yeah, I know. I know the feeling. All right. That's a constant in the numerator, so it comes out, floats into the numerator outside. And then we're integrating 1 over v, and we get natural log of v. And we don't need any absolute values here again because v is positive. So we get, as our final answer, e to the fourth minus e over 2 multiplied by natural log of 3. Subtract off natural log of 1. Natural log of 1 is 0. So there's our final answer. Ooh, boy, oh, boy. Right, now are you ready to do one by yourself? <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll find out. Guys, you're getting it, right? I get the point. What's that in your eyes? Fear. Like <laughs> <laughs> That's a, I'm going to All right, well, now that you get the double integral so well, let's do it in triple integral. <laughs> I was really hoping you'd say that. Yeah, we need to try it ourselves. No, I, no, no, we'll wait. We'll wait. So triple integral, what does the stop share? Triple's. I mean, they're going to set it up nicely for us. Look. What do you think the substitutions are? <laughs> Doesn't don't I mean the the substitutions are pretty suggestive, right? Or maybe not. <clears throat> All right. So the determinant is now a three by three determinant. We're going to have uh, three different. Substitutions, you know, instead of having just u and v, we need u, v, and w. So <laughs> the choice that seems to be obvious is that we're going to let u equal y minus 2x. We're going to let v equal z minus 3y. And we're going to let w equal z minus 4x. So now we have to rewrite. We have somehow we have to solve for x, y, and z. Oh, and there's the other z minus four x over here. <clears throat> All right. So, and the range on them. Let's just write that down while we have it here. So u is going to be between zero and one. V is going to be between. 0 and 1, 
And then W is going to be between 0 and 3. So those will be our limits for those three, the three new variables. All right, now, the hard part here is probably the college algebra. We need to rewrite this system in terms of x, y, and z. We need to solve that for x, y, and z. All right, so how do we do that? We have to eliminate variables. So we have to do some sort of elimination here. And I don't know, which doesn't really matter. So typically what you do is eliminate the same variable from two pairs. Now, the top equation, the y is already missing, uh, excuse me, the z is already missing there. So we could take that one and then take these two and eliminate the z from there. So if there was x, y, and z in all three, you'd have to pick two, eliminate z, pick two others, eliminate z. But because we already have one equation without z, we can just eliminate z from these two and then combine those two. That seems like a reasonable way to go. So our <coughs> next system, we're going to have, actually let's not write it as a system yet. So we're going to take u equals y minus 2x. And then right here, we're going to subtract the equations. So we're going to have v minus w. V minus W equal Z minus Z is zero. That was the whole point. Minus 3Y plus 4X. So now we have minus 3Y plus 4X. Now we have a two variable set up with the X's and the Y's. Let's do that. So now we have to eliminate one of those variables. Or use substitution, it doesn't matter. That seems pretty easy to multiply the top equation by 3 and add them. So if we multiply the top equation by 3, we'll have it. And then we add. So we're going to have, bless you, 3u plus v minus w equals, when we add, the y's go away, and we end up with minus 2x. That we can solve for x now by dividing by minus half. So we've got x. x is equal to minus 3 halves u minus 1 half v plus 1 half w. So there's x. Now we have to get y. And how do we get y? plug it in, right? Back substitute it into that thing. So let's change colors. So u, let's rewrite, let's solve it for y by putting y by itself. So y is going to be equal to u plus 2x. u plus 2x. So we multiply that by 2. So it's going to be u, we're going to distribute it to, so u minus 3, u minus uh, v, I'm just distributing a 2. And now we have y. So y is equal to negative 2u minus v plus w. All right, we're almost there. A little bit of college algebra. Now we have x and y. We have to find z. So let's go to the simplest possible original equation and solve for z. We'll take the middle one. z is equal to... Uh, 3y plus v. z is equal to 3y plus v. So I'm going to multiply this by 3. 3y plus v. Right, is that what it was? 3y plus v. Right there. z equals 3y plus v. So now we have z equals minus 6u. Let's keep it in alphabetical order. Oops, got to add 1 to that, so that's minus 2v plus 3w. All right, now we've got our three equations. We have x, we have y, we have z, and they're all written in the correct order, u, v, w. So now the Jacobian 
is found. So let's slide up here for, uh, let's, let's put it right here. We can do it in a minute. So the Jacobian is a 3 by 3, x sub u, x sub v, x sub w. So minus 3 halves, minus 1 half, 1 half. And then y sub u, y sub v, y sub w. Minus 2, minus 1, 1. Minus 6, minus 2, 3. So now we have to find the determinant of that. Anyone know how to find the 3 by 3 determinant? Anyone have a graphing calculator? I can plug it in real quick and find it for us. Chop, chop! <laughs> <laughs> do you know how to do determinants in your calculator? Yeah, uh, matrices. Because you've done this before. Oh. Do you know how to do it without a calculator? 3 by 3? Determinant? All right, so here's how we're going to do a 3 by 3 if you haven't done it. So the easiest way for a 3 by 3, I'm not going to ask you to do a 3 by 3 on a test unless there's some zeros in it because it takes a little bit of time. You can do determinants in your uh, graphing calculators easily or on, if you just search Wolfram Alpha will do them easily. So to do a 3 by 3 determinant, you have to pick a row to expand about. So if there's any zeros, go for the row with the most zeros. Uh, it doesn't matter which row you go. Let's just keep it simple and go with the top row. And then there's this sign pattern that has to come along for the ride. And they alternate. You put a plus minus plus for your signs. And here's how we're going to do it. So the Jacobian determinant will then be the first number here. So it's plus 1 times this, so it's that number exactly. And then you have to find the determinant of this minor matrix over here. So you eliminate the row and the column that that minus 3 halves came from and find the determinant of the <coughs> remaining numbers. Then we go to the middle column, and we have the minus 1 half. We have to change the sign. Then. We have the sign array that we have to take into consideration. So it's going to end up being plus 1 half instead of minus. Same idea. Cross out the row. Cross out the column that it came from. And it leaves a minor matrix down here. We'll find the determinant of that. And then the last piece, of course, you see the pattern now. The last piece, we take our third number, positive 1 half, matrix, cross out the row in the column, and we're left with negative 2, negative 1, negative 6, negative 2. <coughs> so here we have negative 3 halves multiplied by negative 3 plus 2. Negative 6 plus 6. Positive 4 minus 6. So there is our Jacobian value. And when you're doing this expansion thing, you can expand about any row. You just have to get your sign array on there properly. The safest thing is just to do the top row plus minus plus. Because the sign array alternates all the way through. It's plus minus plus and then minus plus minus and then plus minus plus. So if you do the top row, it's the simplest. Unless there's zeros. All right, so let's, so our integral then is super easy because our triple integral, what would, would we have? dv over d is now triple integral, 1 half, right? There was no integrand in there. And now we have du, dv, dw. These are all constants, right? So we just have a, a, a rectangle. So or a rectangular box, 0, 1, 0, 1. So what's the answer? You should be able to see it right now. 
What was it? Yes! Boom! Excellent. Well done. Right? So the half comes out in front. There's no integrand, so it's just the length of the intervals, 1 times 1 times 3. Three halves. What's it called? Uh, Oh, that's called row reduction. But I mean, these days, the only row reduction you should ever really do is two by two. We have a deal over like by hand. Yeah. I mean, like those calculators can do row reduction in five seconds. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. If you're doing row reduction, that's just tedious. So, uh, you're you're, 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 you're,